welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Uttinger and Brian Brew, and we've wrapped up Isaiah and are starting Jeremiah. Um, as Greg reminded me just a moment ago, this is the last days of Judah, the end of Second Kings and Second Chronicles. We're talking about what has been called the God-shaped hole in the human heart. Um, we are made to worship. And when we refuse to worship the true God, we have to make up something else. And we keep trying these different things. And they lead only to sadness. In the words of Bartok the Bat, this can only end in tears. <laughs> Good authoritative source there. Absolutely. <laughs> well, the passage we're looking at is uh, one verse. From Jeremiah chapter 2. Actually, I'm going to read three of them. Or four. This time, I'm going to start with verse 9. Wherefore, <laughs> I will yet plead with you, saith the Lord, and with your children's children will I plead. For pass over the isles of Katim and see and send unto Kedar, and consider diligently and see if there be such a thing. Hath a nation changed their gods, which are yet no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which doth not profit. Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be very desolate, saith the Lord. And here's the verse we're going to highlight today. For my people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. As God looks at... Judah and its decline, its last days. He says, you got two problems going on here. One, you've forsaken me, who is your light and life, a fountain of living waters, a source of all kinds of life and all kinds of meaning. And as if that were not bad enough, rather than just walking off into the void, into oblivion, you then stop along the way and create something to replace me with. But it's garbage. It's like you walked into a second-hand store and pulled out something and said, oh, look, I must worship this now. Uh, <laughs> so sister, this is the first two commandments. Right? Yeah, Where indeed. The first, first commandment is worship God alone, and the second <laughs> is nothing else. It's like, they're not really two different concepts. So I, huh. I just, it's interesting to me how God does make this distinction over yeah. and over and over, yeah. that these are two different things, even though they always go together. Yes. <laughs> For, in case anyone in our culture, in the 21st century, doesn't know what a cistern is, in lands where um, there are no immediate rivers, brooks, and streams, agricultural societies are very dependent upon rainwater. And so they build big tubs, basically, concrete bowls or stone bowls before there was concrete, to catch the rainwater. And these, these are huge things oftentimes because they have to store water for a long, long time. They're called cisterns. And they're great at storing rainwater unless they're broken, in which case all <laughs> the water drains out of them. And so God here compares himself to a fountain of living water, mm. living in the sense of, in the, the metaphor of water bubbling up out of the ground freely, plentifully, powerfully, over against a cistern, which, yeah, it can have water, probably a little, you know, there are bugs on it and film it's on the top. Water. and Yeah, yeah, it, but it's, it's water. Mm -hmm. Except in this analogy, it's broken and all the water's drained out. So <laughs> you left me and you went after this thing that doesn't work. And it, it's adding insult to injury. You, 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 you've rejected me. And then you go pick up this thing and say, this will meet all my needs. And anyone looking at it with any sense would say, no, it won't. And yet you fall down and worship it or whatever. And I appreciate, Emily, that you started with the idea of worship. He doesn't use the word here, but that is what we're talking about. Because with regard to God, the true God, our approach must be one of worship. He is God. He is self-existent. He's eternal. He is absolute goodness. And we are his image, and therefore our proper response is to echo and reflect that back to him and say, thank you for being who you are, and thank you for what you've done for us, and thank you for me and for making me and being my God. But we take that and we begin to turn it, we, we walk away from God, unthankful, 
and here we could look at Romans 1, where it, the whole series of man's devolution through more, into moral chaos begins, neither were they thankful. Mm-hmm. And then we go after idols, which again is tracking with Romans 1. They conceive of God as um, birds and fish and bugs and whatever, or something in our generation, usually something more abstract, ideas and concepts and ideologies. And what? what, what what's going on here? So we have two things that we can talk about. And in one sense, we've already said everything, but we'll slow it down and talk through it some more. Man is the image of God. Well, man in rebellion against God is in rebellion against God. He doesn't want God. He doesn't want God telling him what to do. He does not want God as his source of meaning. He does not want God as his ultimate definition. He does not want to be in the image of God. He wants God to go away, and he wants to be self-defining. At the same time, being the image of God, he can't pull it off. And so he will try to fill the gap that's left, but he will never try to fill it with God. And so we have some quotes from some authors before us that we may get to. And there, there could be the mistake of saying, well, everybody's looking for God. No, everybody's running away from God. <laughs> what they're looking for is something to replace God. That's not God. That's the problem. And so when we use the arguments, oh, there's this, there's this God-shaped oh, a hole in your heart, unless God intervenes by his grace and spirit and gospel, the response will be, no, there isn't. <laughs> yes, there is. No, there isn't. Okay, see where this is going real fast. So that being said, um, I'm going to kind of direct things back to, to you two for a moment and let you meditate, ruminate on this, and um, see if examples or things you've read or whatever or other parts of Scripture come to mind, and we'll go from there. I have a question maybe we can talk about. Mm-hmm. When we've we've established this this idea that man in his sinful state is avoiding God, is suppressing the truth of God, how do we then talk about those who seem to be looking for God? Does it mm-hmm. think of, you know, Jordan Peterson or Tom Holland or somebody who's looking at Christianity and saying, wait a second, there is something here. And it's better than everything else. How how can we talk about that situation where we see people um, in a way that's faithfully accounting for mm-hmm. the natural state? Um, I think there's probably a couple different ways you could think of it that both acknowledges the, shall we say, the exterior evidence that we see in the mm-hmm. life of those people and also the biblical witness that tells us what underlies it. I think one way to look at it is to say that what underlies it has a multitude of forms when it bubbles through to the surface. So for instance, with uh, with Tom Holland and Jordan Peterson, I think they both suffer from the same issue, which is obviously that they're not Christian. But um, <laughs> in, in, in particular, it's the denial of the miraculous. Mm. Um, that is their underlying framework for the world, their schema for existence. Is that really what we call supernatural things are explainable in some sense? For Jordan Peterson, it's all psychology. It's all the broad historical consensus of human subconscious expressing itself over multiple generations in an evolutionary form. Uh, And for Tom Holland, it's, oh, you know, these people were superstitious, and so they wrote down superstitious things when they wrote their histories. So I I, I feel like they, they still know in their heart that there is something missing, God-shaped hole, so to speak. And they are able to recognize that. Every their their philosophy of life, their metaphysical underpinnings aside, they they recognize that there is an emptiness that needs to be filled. And so they're looking for meaning. They rightfully reject the modernist, postmodernist answers, which is just oh, it's all materialist, nothing matters, there's no meaning or anything. They still try to find these things, and they even see beauty Mm. in the Christian worldview, because they have eyes. Mm. 
Um, <laughs> which God gave them. <laughs> which God gave them. So you can, in a very true sense, say they are closer than anyone else is. But unless there is faith that act- that is actually wrought by God, the whole will remain empty because they're still trying to figure out meaning in a finite from finite resources when the whole that they are looking for is infinite. Mm. Yeah. And that's, that's really key, isn't it? That mm-hmm. the that God has to make the change. And speaking theologically, there's a binary, right? You're either oriented in enmity toward God, or you are brought into his family and his kingdom, and your heart is changed to love him. And experience is messy, and we have to recognize that it is God who makes the difference and not talk about it like there is no way of moving from one to the other, right. except that God does it. Right, because the other aspect too is that God does use means. Mm-hmm. You know, for for both of these men uh, that we've mentioned by name, in one sense, it is a good thing that they're that they're doing this because God may use these means to bring them to faith. Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, it is if they end up not, mm-hmm. it's a greater burden of proof against them. Yeah, that it's they saw them. all these things. That that's that should be sobering to us. It should not be something we go like, oh, well, they got close, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Missed it by that much. Yeah. Too bad, so right. sad. But like, no, we, we when, would when love for them to come into the kingdom of God. But yeah, like when, when you are looking at things, you know, um, I forget exactly what the context was, but I remember something you said, Greg, in one of your classes, which was basically, yes, it matters that you are not Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's like... <laughs> It, it, there, there is a um, a true metaphysically real importance to what you have, and that could be temporal. Uh, you know, like um, I think it's a quote from Luther where he says, like, you know, somebody said, "Oh, well, what happens if these people do good works and they don't they don't love Jesus? That what what happens if they do good stuff for their neighbor?" And it's like, well, then the neighbor got good works out of it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. Very Germanically uh, practical of him. <laughs> yeah, that's what the Lutherans say. You know, God doesn't need your good works, but your neighbor does. Yep, mm-hmm. exactly. That's probably actually another thing. I probably heard that from Chris Rosberg. Honestly, <laughs> <laughs> he's a good egg. He is. Uh, well, you have said some marvelous things. Um, I thought what you said, Brian, was very insightful and to the point, and also very. Not just pointed, but broad in 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 what it touched on. Uh, you mentioned, for instance, beauty, among mm-hmm. other things. Uh, these men have a sense that there's something better out there, and we can guess that it has to do with their upbringing, with the their education, with the remnants of Christendom that they've been exposed to, the cathedrals and the castles and the gardens and the paintings and the literature, whatever. I don't know their their biographies. But I, I, I've i known a lot of, well, frankly, role players <laughs> who are very honorable men and women who love that kind of culture and enjoy role playing in it and want to do the right thing. And they want to be heroes after almost a biblical pattern. And yet they themselves aren't Christians. And if you bring too much Christianity in the storyline, they get nervous. They're well, appreciating the fruit of Christianity. And, and you can question why that should be. And, and a lot of it's got to, it has to be the explanation of, well, how did you grow up? Who were your parents? Who were your friends? What books did you read? Those are real things. Mm-hmm. We're not programmed, but we are exposed. And what God has put in our souls and our personalities by common grace, by divine providence, uh, is going to respond to that. And and some people are going to say, this is really cool. This is beautiful. This is elegant. This has depth. This has balance that mere materialism or postmodernism doesn't have. In other words, I like this. <laughs> well, we're glad you do. 
Well, and <laughs> That's it's not enough. <laughs> it's interesting too because I uh, this past week I saw someone reference a study a survey that was done. So they asked the same question to everyone, but the particular group that was of interest was atheists slash agnostics. They were asked, "Do you think that?" There should be a strong Christian religion in the United States, and like 60, 40 percent of them answered yes. And even stranger, one percent of atheists said yes to the question: Do you think that if there's a conflict between written law and a scriptural standard, that scripture should be the superior answer? <laughs> <laughs> and one <laughs> percent of them said yes. Okay, well, which is very um, interesting. <laughs> But like yeah. you're saying, it, it is very much like they still identify as being not believers. <laughs> the entire reason they answer in the affirmative is because of its practicality, not mm-hmm. because of its its truth or its having affected them. They mm-hmm. recognize that, oh, wait, you know, oddly enough, this Christian society in the West operates really well when it is like operating in accordance with the heritage of 2000 years of Western society. <laughs> How weird that a Western society would do that. Yeah. I mean, isn't, isn't it amazing? We got lucky with this coincidence of superstitions that all merged at one time to give us this <laughs> worldview, which is utterly superstitious and wrong, but has this wonderful fruit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Huh. It's because, like, this, like this water there's... is really great and quenches my thirst, but I hate that it's coming out of this fountain. I'm going to put it in this pot. The pot <laughs> has a hole in it, but at least I've got the water. Yeah. <laughs> For the well, moment, like, um, <laughs> it spir- yeah. spirals you know, down. There's two like ditches. There's two opposing ditches as far as Christian response. There's the uh, Anabaptist way, which is to be like, <laughs> well, we we can't like we can't put laws that are Christian in character on the books because mm-hmm. because then they wouldn't be they wouldn't be done out of out of true Christian character. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Jesus said my kingdom is not of this world, so it would be wrong then, to impose his standard of justice on the world. And then there's the opposite end of the <laughs> spectrum, which is like, well, we have to force every iota of Christian character onto the populace or else mm. uh, Christendom yeah. won't come. It's like, no, 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 you don't have to go either <laughs> ditch. No. Uh, there's a there's a wonderful balance beam, and you can have a pole that you hold onto that balances you, and it'll be great. <laughs> And I mean, honestly, Protestant uh, social theory has been like that, um, Mm. historically speaking, anyway. Yeah. And at the same time, I'm always cautious about the uh, falling off either side of the horse or a ditch on each side of the road. (laughs) Like, not to negate anything you said, I think that was spot on. But there's the logical fallacy of the via media. That mm, yes. Please translate for people who do not know the uh, Latin. The middle road, yes. where we've set up two alternatives and neither of them is right. But because we've, we've framed the issue with those two positions stated as the extremes, you think, well, the right way has to be in the middle. But how, how can we reframe the issue such that it becomes clear what the right answer is, not just as some harmonization of two arbitrary endpoints? Yeah, um, you remind me, and this isn't immediately relevant, but it's an example. When I'm teaching government class, and we we draw the political mm-hmm. spectrum. We have mm-hmm. anarchy on one side and tyranny on the other. And I've actually seen this in, in some conservative books. And the idea is, well, we don't want tyranny, but we don't want anarchy, but we want to be closer to anarchy than to tyranny. <laughs> why? Yeah. <laughs> First of all, why? <laughs> I mean, not only practically, but philosophically. Why mm-hmm. are you choosing that? But um, do you notice that all of these options are thoroughly humanistic? Mm-hmm. Do we want some human, a, a little bit of humanistic tyranny along with a lot of humanistic anarchy? That does not sound like a good idea. Maybe it's not a continuum. Maybe that's the continuum of all the wrong answers. <laughs> And the right answer is off the chart, and each of those extremes is showing us something in the the correct answer, but the correct answer is not simply balancing the two. It's Mm -hmm. something that is not naturalistic, not something that arises out of man's fallen nature, Mm -hmm. but something supernatural revealed by God. Yeah, and yet the externals can look very similar, right? And they can. Mm -hmm. They certainly can. Uh, you drop into a, a, a nice community, let's say on, oh, America in the late 1880s, someplace in Indiana, 
where everybody gets along, maybe there's a town sheriff or something, and he maybe uh, calls in the town drunk every Saturday. And um, <laughs> We're in Mayberry. <laughs> yeah. I mean, such places existed once upon a time. And a libertarian or an anarchist could come here and say, there's no government here. Well, a couple answers to that. Well, there, 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 are the, there are the semblances of some kind of government. There are select men who run, you know, the town officially and vote for little things here and there and a sheriff. But even more primarily, the government is the people. They govern themselves. Mm -hmm. And in the absence, in the presence of self-government, you don't need this other stuff. Is it anarchy? No. Mm -hmm. There is law and order here. But it's been internalized. Mm -hmm. And probably the churches have more to say, and families have more to say, than these few officers who get together now and then and, and, and pass some rules. Mm -hmm. So again, yeah, it can. Uh, there are things in American history that can look very libertarian or very even anarchistic if you have a very narrow checklist. But mm -hmm. if you went and talked to these people and said, you believe there should be no government, they'd be horrified. Yeah. This, this idea of self-government yeah. uh, is, I, I feel like we can we can root into that a little further. Uh, my college is honor code, um, on and on and on. It, I mean, it's not that long. But the, <laughs> the, uh, the punchline, as it were, is through education, the student rises to self-government. Mm -hmm. um, and... You know, yes, but also no. <laughs> um, you know, self-government for self-government's sake is a, a means to an end. And what is that end? You know, you could have a lot of self-governed dictators. <laughs> yeah, they, I mean, they need, dictators need to be very self-disciplined if they're going to succeed. Those yeah, that are it's slaves, not like it's easy being Lenin or Stalin. No, it's not. If you're a slave to your immediate sensual passions, you may be in bed with your mistress drinking yourself drunk when the Allies are rolling their tanks across your border. You know, it just doesn't work that <laughs> well. Um, yeah, but that kind of self-discipline uh, in the West traditionally has been the product of Christianity again. You mentioned Lenin, Hitler, you had Stalin, Castro. These men grew up in the church. They were sometimes choir boys or, or theology students, um, certainly members of the of the national church. And they saw it and they picked some of the good fruit and then they rebelled against the reality, but they took the self-discipline and the vision with them. I can change the world. I can be the difference. I can, if I if I discipline myself and if I'm smart, I'm educated, then I can give the world what it needs, which just turns out to be me. But that's you know the 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 tribes in Netherlands, New Guinea, never set out to conquer the world. <laughs> that's right. They were busy eating each other. <laughs> yes, exactly. It takes it takes somebody touched by that kind of vision. Usually, mm -hmm. now sometimes it's grown up in in the east. I mean, you think of Genghis Khan, and there are a few mm -hmm. others who have had a different sort of vision and were very self-disciplined without the evident uh, presence of Christianity. But the further the world goes, the more difficult that is. This is the parable of mm -hmm. the wheat and tares again. Yeah. Um, the further we go into history, the more unself-disciplined humanism and paganism are. And they, the harder it is for them to hold things together and make it look good. But we're kind of going off. We've kind of gone way off uh, the reservation here. <laughs> yeah. I was just noticing that. <laughs> so let's, let's, let's pull it back. But it, there, there is application here because we're back to, we've been talking political systems. Mm -hmm. But that's part of the picture. Why you, you ask why do Tom Holland and Jordan Peterson appreciate Christian morality? Well, in part, they see it as a basis for civil morality, including politics but particularly, at least with Tom Holland, for public charity. And he was caught by how kind and generous certain Christian institutions were and assumed that, that the pagan religions had been the same. And it shocked him to go back and find out, no, they weren't, nor do they want to be, nor do they intend to be, nor had they been hijacked. They just didn't want, they didn't care about people. My favorite okay. quote from him on that po exact point is, I was so shocked to go back and like, it's like I grew up reading the sanitized versions yeah. of pagan cultures like Roman Greece, and I loved them growing yeah. up. And I finally got old, and I read the primary sources, and I was shocked to find none of the things that I loved about Western society there. Yeah. And if brutal, I can take us on a tangent, 
Towards, yeah, sorry, ahead. I interrupted. <laughs> if we can take a tangent on this towards education, we can do our children a great disservice by having them read those sanitized versions mm-hmm. and never yeah. going to the original sources. We can lead them yeah. into that error and let them stay there because it's fun. I, I don't like it. <laughs> Two words, Edith Hamilton. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, no. <laughs> can we read a better non-sanitized version, please? <laughs> Is that, is uh, that Delaire's? Is that the better version? I don't know. I genuinely didn't. Oh, you weren't, sure. you weren't in school a... for World Ed? Uh, no. no. Oh, not. well, that's the that's... I mean, like I did in college, but that's Yeah, that's the, uh, yeah. the the book we use, the sanitized version we use to teach Greek mythology in mm. school. Or to not teach it as you, if you prefer. <laughs> because at the end, I have to go back and explain to them or along the way, look, for instance, I actually did this little speech today. So when you when the when Edith is telling you that Apollo ran after this beautiful girl because he loved her and wanted her, and she uh, was running from him and cried out to the gods to save her, and they turned her into a tree, what was going on here? And the kid said, he wanted to rape her, and so the gods killed her. Okay, thank you. We're moving on now. <laughs> that was pretty well it. <laughs> but that's how you sanitize Greek and pagan culture. Uh, you, there's you, there's you other add subtleties Christian we can categories address. to it. Sorry, you add Christian categories. Yeah, you it. add Christian categories, mm-hmm. and this passionate desire to rape is oh, he loved her. Yeah, not in any kind of Christian sense, and it's and, and she had every right to be frightened to death, and mm-hmm. death is what she got because turning being turned into a tree. I, I, I thought the kids were really good on this one. Amounts to they killed her. That was their idea of helping her. Okay, you'll never have me raped. You're dead now. We turned you into a, a non sentient thing. And uh, uh, that reminds me of the, the I've brought it up before the bits in um, City of God by Augustine, yeah. where he confronts the, the the pagans accuse the the women who were nuns, basically uh, mm-hmm. of some kind, uh, who were sexually assaulted and raped mm-hmm. by the pagan invaders of Rome. Yeah. And they basically said, oh, they must have wanted it because otherwise they would have saved their honor by killing themselves. Uh, the, the pagans <laughs> say this. And Augustine basically goes, life's more important than that. <laughs> it's like, and, and he, even, he even goes further and says, you know, they didn't will this. Mm-hmm. And as a result, God holds their virginity whole, basically. Yeah. Um, but Exactly that. Their, the, their honor the, is unblemished. Their their holiness before the Lord, their their virtue, that's the fruit of the spirit, is unblemished. You can't people can't take that away from you by what they do to you externally. That's part of Augustine's yep. Aga argument throughout all that. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Uh, and, and and so again, our our friends, Jordan Peterson, Tom Holland. And I would like to think that if we met them, we would be friends. We wouldn't. Yeah. We, we I'd would love to have them on the I podcast. So. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be we, so fun. We, gentlemen, if you're listening, by some fluke of God's providence, give us a call or an email. Mm-hmm. Halting towards um, Zion at gmail.com. Yeah. There we go. We would, uh, we'd love to talk to you. We promise not to be obnoxious. And we'd love to hear what you have to say, too. Mm-hmm. We can give you plenty of airtime. Because we see in such men God's good gifts. And... Whereas every human is the image of God, sometimes it's a, it's you know we're weak, and sometimes some some unbelievers are simply cooler than other unbelievers. <laughs> we're, we're drawn toward them and say, "Wow, wouldn't it be great for the kingdom of God if you were converted?" Well, you know we're shallow minded. We do that, mm-hmm. uh, but truly, uh, here are men who have special gifts who would be a great blessing to God's kingdom. Already are in some ways, despite themselves, <laughs> because they they see the good fruits. They just can't figure out really why they're there, uh, and they don't know what to do with it. So, Emily, you asked a question a long time ago. I, I think we've we've kind of worked around to it. Uh, do they are they seeking God? No, they're not. Are they appreciating the fruit of what God has done? Oh yeah, but that's not unusual. Every mother who takes her baby in her arms for the first time and smiles big and coos back at the baby is appreciating the good gift of God. 
the gourmand who has this incredibly detailed meal made by the greatest chef in France and takes a bite and smiles and sighs is appreciating the good gifts of God. Anyone who looks at a painting by um, Turner, say, or Rembrandt, and and stares in awe is appreciating the good gifts of God. We It's not that easy to get away from God. Yeah. <laughs> I remember it you saying really in is. Bible class one time, like, we're finite creatures. God's goodness is infinite. Like yeah. we keep trying to push him out of our box, but he just comes right back in. Yeah. It's like yeah. you live in God's universe. You are mm. going to run into him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That is a great line. <laughs> we need to write that one down. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and there's a verse that I keep trying to remember, and I do not remember it, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to butcher it because I don't remember, and I think it's in Jeremiah. But it, it amounts to you can, the ungodly can taste the bitterness of their own sins. It's, they, and in, in Deuteronomy, in the Song of Moses, there's a, our, our rock is not as their rocks, mm-hmm. our enemies themselves are being witness. When we talk about total depravity, it does not mean that unbelievers cannot say two things. They cannot say, my sin sure stinks. Yes, they can say that. They can realize full well, my sin stinks. My lifestyle stinks. My worldview stinks. That they're capable of. They are also capable of saying, and Christianity somehow isn't like my worldview. (laughs) Now, that's not the same thing as saying Christianity is better. Or that, boy, I want to be a Christian. But it the, the unbeliever in his unbelief is still capable of seeing those two things, that his sin is self-destructive and leads nowhere, and is in, in many ways horrible. Now, he doesn't understand it's rebellion against a holy God he ought to love. He just knows, well, let's see, my worldview has given me alcoholic addiction, drug addiction, several sexual diseases, a broken family, no money in the bank, and I'm living under a bridge. I don't think, uh, you know, there are some people who are content with that, but most people would say, that's horrible. That stinks. And, and unbelievers Something can along say the that. the line went wrong. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they can also say things like, you know, my brother, that, that, that guy who's all about Jesus, he doesn't have these problems. I wonder why that is. <laughs> yeah. Because still, the rebellion against God takes first place. We, we can be off. We can see that there's something missing, something wrong. And yet when we're told, well, Jesus, like, yeah, no, not, that's not it. <laughs> because that would mean surrendering my heart, surrendering who gets to set my priorities, my values, my perspectives. Someone gets to be the boss of me that's not me. And that's bad. <laughs> that's tyranny. Uh, I believe, and all of Western literature, particularly Romanticism, but also rationalism, reinforces that I am autonomous. I do what I do. I do me. You do you. I don't care about you. My choices are my choices. I'm responsible for them. And nobody ultimately gets to tell me what to do. And that's that's the way the world is, right? That's That's good. <laughs> and along it's comes this Christianity. Yeah, it's, it's self-government. Self-circle. And Christianity comes and says, no, you have to lay all that at the feet of Jesus. God God has to be the one who does that. And you say, well, that's wrong. I, 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 there may be a religious solution, but that's not it. Maybe I just need to realize that I already am God, or that I'm in touch with God, or that God is already in my soul, and that I'm perfectly justified in being in charge of things and making my decisions. The one thing he will not do is lay down his rebellion. Until the Holy Spirit changes his heart through the gospel, mm-hmm. and and I'd like to uh, to I mentioned some quotes that we have. I'd like to just throw them out here. The one you I think you've already mentioned them. Blaise Pascal, mm-hmm. there's a God shaped vacuum in the heart of every person, and it can never be filled by any created thing. It can only be filled by God, made known through Jesus Christ. Pascal rocks. Just going to yeah. throw that out there. <laughs> I, I really enjoy reading Pascal. This is this is Pascal of Pascal's Wager. For those mm-hmm. of you who might know him that way, he's also which I don't love. Yeah, <laughs> that that's, one part of him I don't that's love. not the greatest argument. <laughs> but I enjoy, but yeah. It's the sort of argument. But this this statement uh, is straightforward. Now, notice what it says and what it doesn't say. 
there is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every person. In other words, God should have an overflowing presence in the heart of every man, and if man does not have that, there is a deficiency, and nothing created can take that, can only be filled by God, then Christ. What he does not say is, and you all know that, (laughs) because we don't know that. We feel the lack, but we do not know and will not acknowledge that it's our rebellion against God that's created it. Um, and, and, and so we can, we can talk to people and, and point out the idols, the broken cisterns they've made. You try to fill it with music. You fill it with art. You fill it with your family. You fill it with good food. You fill it with adventure or with travel or with old books or with mathematics, with science, mm-hmm. or maybe some other religion. You're, you're very busy trying to fill the hole. And yet what you're going to find at the end of the day, if we push you and press you, and that's what Christian apologetics in part is about, we're going to push you and press you and, and, and get you finally to admit that it doesn't quite make it. There's, you, you, you've, you've idolized these things, and what you will find is that they are broken cisterns. They don't fill the hole. Now, that doesn't mean you're ready to become a Christian. You will look at Christianity and still say, well, that sure won't. That's even worse. But there's there's something missing. And then C.S. Lewis, in response to this, says first, um, I don't know if this quote's from The Weight of Glory, the next one is, if I find in my desire, if, if I find in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. Well, Jack, I'm sorry, that's not the only logical explanation, <laughs> and it's not, most people are not going to buy that. I think that's from mere Christianity. From mere Christianity. Listen, this next quote is from The Weight of Glory. He says this, A man's physical hunger does not prove that man will get any bread. He may die of starvation on a raft in the Atlantic, but surely a man's hunger does prove that he comes of a race which repairs its body by eating and inhabits a world where eatable substances exist. In the same way, though I do not believe, I wish I did, that my desire for paradise proves that I shall enjoy it, I think it's a pretty good indication that such things exist and that some men will. Hmm. Well, uh, sorry, Jack, the, the, <laughs> the, the, the rationalist world and the postmodern world will simply say, you're having a subjective experience which proves nothing whatsoever. Uh, maybe that desire you feel is mere superstition. People have been absolutely convinced that ghosts are real, and maybe that's because um, they want some excitement in their life, or maybe because they miss their dead Aunt Tessie and they are hoping she comes out, you know, a million different reasons. But no matter how sincere that that belief is, it doesn't make ghosts real. And, and then to go even further, uh, the desire may just as easily be evidence of the individual's lack of eternal re- internal resources. Well, you're just the weak kind of person that has to supply things to make yourself strong. I understand that for you, you poor s- slob, but <laughs> I don't need such crutches. Or take it even further, yeah, the universe is inherently irrational and we don't fit in it. And um, that's all that Lewis has discovered here. Yes, you are in fact in a world feeling hungry where food is not a thing. Because that's just how screwed up the universe is. Welcome to reality. <laughs> Uh, and, and so he's feeling after he knows there's something here, but he's going for a direct proof and it doesn't work because you can't get around the inherent self-centeredness of sin. Uh, the unbeliever is not going to admit that he's walked away from the only God who gives meaning and purpose. You can get him to say a lot of things and you may be, you might even get something real close to that. There are some people who will say the words, yes, I believe Christianity is true. Yes, I believe Jesus died for sinners. Yes, I believe God created the world and rules it. I just want no part of that. Okay, that's um, psychotic. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it, It's real close to reality, but not at all close to reality. And the problem is still the same. So you're convinced. At this point, we, we have to start worrying about the what scripture calls the unpardonable sin or apostasy, Mm -hmm. where you look God in the face and say, oh, you're God. Well, I hate you, wish you were dead, and I'm walking off. Don't, don't, I'm not leaving a uh, mailing address. Leave me alone. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. As we've said before, it's a problem of ethics, not of information. Exactly. Where you're ethically opposed to God. Yeah. You look at God and say, well, if you're God, then you're the devil. I don't want anything to do with this. Mm -hmm. Or I'm just going to hang you out the window because it's irrelevant. You're irrelevant to me because I'm still the God of my universe. Uh, it is ultimate insanity. And yet that's where this will go, despite this strong evidence. And so we create idols. There's a, there's a better quote from Lewis that I put here toward the end. Amiable agnostics talk cheerfully about man's search for God. To me, as I was then speaking about the days before his conversion, to me as I was then, they might, have well, might as well have talked about the mouse's search for the cat. <laughs> He was, for those of you who don't know, Lewis was not always a Christian. That came from Surprise by Joy, his spiritual biography, autobiography. And so there was a time when theism was closing in on him. He was becoming, and, and again, another, I don't remember the exact quote, but it's it's very similar to um, what Tom Holland was saying, that my philosophy, my materialism led me to despise Christianity and everything in it, but all of the books I loved, all the stories <laughs> I loved, led me right back to Christianity. Mm -hmm. And so I was living this, this schizophrenic or, or split personality kind of reality where reason said Christianity is a lie, but all of my ascetic and emotional senses said, but it produces the things I love. And so he had to struggle with that. And eventually... Uh, and the story, although I've never seen it from either Lewis or Tolkien in detail, uh, amounts to Tolkien saying, well, you love the myths. I love the myths. Think of Christianity as a true myth, but <laughs> it, it's, it's, Hold up. <laughs> it's, it has all the beauty and power of these myths you love, except for one thing. It actually happened. And um, huh. And so Lewis struggled with that for a while, and he was able to begin intellectually to move toward theism. But there was still the intellectual objections, and there was still the hard objection of, but I want to be me. I want to do me. I want, mm -hmm. to, I want to do my own thing. And it still took some steps to get him there, even the simple transition to theism, as he, again, mm -hmm. records it. He's, you know, a lot of people have these wonderful... Heaven opened and light came down and angels play. Like, I, that was not me. I felt sicker than anybody in England that night. You know, <laughs> like I was going to throw up and climbed into bed. It was just horrible because- It sounds like Rosaria Butterfield. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My, my world just crashed and I didn't know what to do with that. There's a, a, a similar quote from a theologian James Montgomery. He says, it's very simple. We invent religion- not because we're seeking God, but because we're running away from him. It's commentary on Romans. So this is the kind of thing we're talking about. Uh, can we, we, I want to jump back to what you were saying about these men who get so close and miss. What, what should we say? Well, of course, you pointed out that they do us a lot of good, mm -hmm. and we can thank God for these, these men who have written historical and moral treatises that have uh, shaken up the world and got them to got people to take a second look at Christianity and, and thus have done good to their neighbor and to Christ's church, whether they intended it or not. So mm -hmm. that's all good. But there's another question, and it's one that only God can can sort out. Um, what happens when you come this close to the truth and turn away? And there are two possible answers, and only God knows. One is well, you are so responsible now because you looked it in the face and you turned your back. Or is it, well, at least you're not Hitler? Because the Bible does make a real distinction of degrees of punishment in hell. It, it, it is God's goodness to us, common goodness, common grace, whatever you want to call it, um, that we are not as bad as we could be. And that's something that is not only for now, it resonates through eternity. He who knew his master's will and did things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with many stripes, but the, he who did not know his master's will and did things worthy of stripes will be beaten with few, for unto whom much is given, the same much is required. So what do you do with that? Um, 
in some ways, ignorant, ignorance apparently is bliss. If you're ignorant <laughs> and a pretty good, nice guy, hell won't be as bad. <laughs> dot, bliss dot, being dot. a relative term here. But yes. <laughs> Uh, and not being as bad, being way relative, because it's still hell where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And part of the punishment of hell is that you can you can look back on your earthly life and say, this really hurts. This is horrible. I am suffering. I am tormented. And in my earthly life, had I not done this thing, you remember that the, the rich man in hell wanted just a drop of water on his tongue, mm -hmm. it would be the equivalent of a drop of water. I would be just a little not at suffering, whatever that may mean to the lost. <laughs> and that's part of the psychological punishment. They can look back on their earthly life and see that their earthly actions have eternal consequences. And they can regret, yes, I should have not pushed that old lady into the street and then jumped <laughs> up and down on her Ooh. because it would hurt a little, little infinitesimally less, but it would be less because this is horrible. Now, in case there's anyone out there who's thinking, wow, you're making God sound really mean. No, this is a very just and holy God who, against whom we have sinned infinitely and from whom we deserve this. We deserve to be turned over to our own devices and to the, the wickedness of our own heart. And the flip side is, but, but couldn't these people just come into heaven for a little while? No, because they don't want to. That's the whole point here. They didn't want God on earth, and they don't want him in hell. There's no one in hell who would say, oh, if I could just be in heaven for a little while. Because in heaven, they're face to face with God, whom they hate above all else. Mm. And so as bad as hell is, they don't want heaven. See C.S. Lewis's great divorce here for a fictional play out of this. And so we, we, we look at, at men who say true things. And we are thankful for them. We are thankful that they're a blessing to their neighbor and to the Church of Christ and to the Kingdom of God. And we hope and pray that having come this far, God will bring them over the hurdle, the hurdle of their own unbelief and rebellion, into the Kingdom of God. But it still will take God's mercies. It will take the sovereign work of the Spirit. They're not going to get there by appreciating beauty, by recognizing the value of love, by res rescuing the positive historical contributions of Christianity to culture, none of those things are saving. We can be thankful for all of them, but they don't reconcile a fallen human soul to the holy, just God who made the world. Mm -hmm. And so that should move us to be human. It should move us to tears and to prayers and to sincerely saying, hey, guys, come talk to us. Uh, you may think we're just a bunch of kids playing in a giant's kitchen, but we actually do have something I think you might want to hear, and maybe, maybe God's prepared us to say it. So Jordan Peterson, Tom Holland, if you hear this, we're not full of ourselves, but we know the God who made the universe. And we can maybe, maybe God will use us to show you the thing you're missing, because it will take a work of the Spirit of God. It's going to take a miracle. But hey, we have a God who does miracles every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we hope not to be full of ourselves, but full of the Spirit of God. Full of the Spirit of God. Which would sound absolutely ridiculous to anyone who's not a Christian. Right. <laughs> yeah. I can't help that. <laughs> it's part of the offense of the cross. Yeah. Well, we should wrap up with some recommendations. Greg, I think yours was pertinent, so we'll transition with yours. Yeah, um, one... Uh, a source I didn't quote from along the way is uh, Francis Schaeffer's little book, Death in the City. It's a collection of sermons, some of them, most of them from Jeremiah and some from Romans 1, and suddenly I realize why he put those two together. <laughs> um, but it's, it, as opposed to his analysis of philosophy and culture, the kind of thing he usually does, uh, it's more of a, here's what it means to be human when the world's falling down around you, when your culture's disintegrating, when everyone is after the, their broken cisterns, here's how you deal with that. Here's how you try to reach out to people. It's not the final word. It's not exhaustive. It's just, as I said, it's a short book. But I think for those of us who are tempted toward a rationalistic approach to Christianity, well, teach them the doctrines and they'd better believe them. This is, this is a start. This is a, um, wait, that's not quite how it works. So, Death in the City, 
Francis Schaeffer. Cool. Well, my recommendation is relevant to the recognizing beauty and aesthetics. Hmm. And my recommendation is to sing and dance in your house. Um, <laughs> okay. Gretchen has started to enjoy both of these things. <laughs> uh, we were at a, at a hymn sing yesterday and um, I was playing piano. And so our friend Rachel was holding Gretchen and she said afterwards, she was singing with us like she was going ah <laughs> like, whenever we the group was singing Gretchen was there making noise too and we've started dancing around the house and she like if a, a song comes on that she likes she'll sit there and bounce and look at me like <laughs> here I am come dance with me so it's a great thing oh, that's beautiful and everybody should do it <laughs> yep. first you gotta get a baby well that yeah I mean, you don't have to have a baby for dancing and singing. You mean you could Um, dance with your spouse? Yeah, or even by yourself. Solo Mm. Charleston is fun. So is solo blues. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, Brian, your turn. Yeah, uh, dog park. Mm, Mm. We took uh, both of our dogs to the dog park today. And we got very lucky because there were a lot of really... There, there were a lot of dogs there first, uh, it being a dog park. But also, uh, <laughs> one guy had two little, maybe four or five months old, maybe seven months old at the most, like Australian Shepherd puppies. Oh, mm-hmm. boy. Okay. And uh, they were named Xena and Freya. And, <laughs> I see where uh, this is going. Xena was very much the social butterfly, and Freya was very much the... Dun- don't look at me. <laughs> I'm too great for you. It was really funny. They were very sweet. Um, so yeah, if you're a dog person anyway, I recommend going to the dog park. If you have a dog, take your dog to the dog park. Um, Can you because, go to the dog park if you don't have a dog or is it weird? I would. I, mean, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anyone's going to complain. <laughs> of course, if you show up and uh, you're the only one there. Then it looks a little weird because you're just like walking around like mm, <laughs> Wish there nice was some grass dogs here. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Cool. We should talk about dog parks later. <laughs> for now, we got to wrap up the show. So thank you so much for this conversation, both of you. It's been a delight. Thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Thank you to our financial supporters. We appreciate you keeping the show rolling. If you'd like to join their number, you can visit our website, anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion, or our Patreon, patreon.com slash halting towards Zion. And as always, the best way to get in touch with us is to send us an email, haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. And thank you so much for listening. Hope to see you again soon. <laughs>